Program professor of journalism at New York University, author of her latest, The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business Diversity, Inc. Pamela Newkirk, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, let's, I mean, let's first start, I guess, with um, the, uh, the, what that billion dollar business is uh, before we get on to the, the failed prom, both the, the promise and the <laughs> failure, I guess. Um, right. Cause I don't, I'm not sure that um, people are totally savvy as to the, the existence of diversity as an industry. Right. And, and it's kind of a different way of thinking of it. But um, so I guess I'll start at the beginning when I, uh, was thinking about this project, what what brought me to it was just constantly reading these reports um, by companies like Google. Uh, like every year they would look at their diversity numbers and issue a report, and every year they would talk about the disappointing results. And then uh, I also kept reading about these uh, institutional scandals, if you will, where, um, you know, there was some revelation either about um, a racial episode in the workplace that then, you know, would cause the the company, the institution, the higher diversities are. And then, you know, I just started reading about all of the money that is spent on diversity by various institutions every year, um, I, I, the, the task forces the, that are assembled and the climate surveys that are commissioned and the diversity consultants that are hired and the diversity czars and the diversity conferences that draw hundreds of people uh, to, you know, to cities around the country and then started thinking of it as an industry. And we're looking at an industry that is actually growing um, by leaps and bounds, uh, particularly over the past couple of years with um, the rise in movements like uh, Me Too and Black Lives Matter. The diversity uh, uh, jobs are on the rise. Um, and it, the, uh, there was a study um, by Indeed.com uh, that that showed that the numbers had gone up something like 35% over the, over the last couple of years, um, you know, the postings for diversity jobs. So we're, we're talking about an industry. Uh, a professor at MIT uh, more than 10 years ago had said at that time companies were spending something like uh, $8 billion a year on diversity, and since that time the numbers have gone up. So we're talking about a, a, a burgeoning industry. And it, it, I mean, the uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but I mean, from your mm. perspective and, and, and we should say that, you know, one of the books you wrote uh, within the veil, black journalists, white media sort of, mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, uh, extrapolated on on the problem uh, on some mm -hmm. level. Um, right. Right. Yeah. How we're not really making the progress that one would think we would have made over 50 years of looking at this issue and, and yeah. grappling with this issue. And I, and I want to get to that because that's the, uh, that's the failed promise, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But does the, to the extent, I mean, is there a way to maybe even make this assessment, but when we see the reaction of, you know, the, the sort of the apparatus, right, to increase mm -hmm. diversity, how sincere you know, and we could talk about the efficacy of this apparatus and, and, and why it, it has not been effective. But how sincere mm -hmm. is the effort, do you think? I mean, because we do see it in reaction to like, oh, we had employees who removed, um, you know, uh, two uh, black people from our store because uh, and now we've got to we're going to have all this <laughs> right. training. Like how how right. sincere? we're going to have this big like public kind of uh right how much of it is public relations and well, and how much well, of it is a a sense 
I mean, how much of it is, what, what, to what extent can you attribute w what motives to it, I guess? Right. Well, well, only only the institutional leaders can, can honestly say how sincere they are. I, I can only look at the results of their efforts, um, that they're spending billions of dollars on something and getting and having very little to show for it and doing the same thing over and over that it, that is not bearing results. So I'm just wondering why. Why, you know, when you keep doing the same thing and getting the same results, then maybe you need to try something new, right? Um, so, you know, that's that's in part what inspired me to look at this because it's like we're having the same conversations for decades, the exact same conversations. You know, looking at these numbers where black law partners um, increase from one point. 7% to 1.8% between 1985 and 2016, looking at um, uh, black men in management um, at companies with 100 and more employees going from 3% to 3.2% over years. Um, you know, the, the, the largest uh, public fashion and apparel companies where only 11% of board seats are held by people of color who, who comprise roughly 40% of the population. So if if all of these companies are spending, you know, some hundreds of millions and, you know, you know, collectively billions of dollars a year, a year and having so little to show for it, like what could we do differently? What what um, like what new ways might we look at at a systemic problem? Um because surely what's happening now is not working. All right. And before we get to sort of like that, that concept of, of solution, and, and I think, you know, you give um, obviously um, the statistics that you just laid out for us are indicative, of, uh, you know, across uh, any number of industries in, 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 right. a, in a myriad of different ways. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you talk about the entertainment industry uh, as well in that regard. Um, like, I guess... Um, the 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 relevance of the question. I mean, obviously, you can't um, you can't assess intent, but right. are there indications? And I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't have a. I, I'm, I, it sounds like the, this is an agenda driven question, but it's not. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm just curious to what extent, like, is mission accomplished simply by showing the expenditure? Like, well. Yeah, um, I, I I think that's the approach that many of these institutions are taking. That to um, to simply construct an apparatus of diversity is indication of n enough that that institution cares about diversity. And I, I'm not certain that many institutional leaders are owning their role in the in the result part of it. Like, you know, they're kind of farming it out to a consultant or to um, some marginalized division within the institution instead of actually saying that, you know, this is something that I as a leader need to incentivize. Um, you know, when leaders of companies actually care about something, <laughs> right. they, could, they, can, they can move the needle. Um, if they don't farm it out and actually say the buck stops with me, um, you could see this this problem pretty much, um, you could see progress pretty much overnight in many institutions if that kind of intention is, is brought to bear. So I, I think, um, you know, when you ask me how sincere they are, I mean, they may think they're sincere, they may be sincere, but... If this was another kind of problem that affected their bottom line and they were failing consistently, I, I would just imagine that, you know, if you're a CEO of a company and things are failing and you're throwing a lot of money at it, you, you're going to want to try something different. And so I, I think with this problem, I think there needs to be some serious soul searching to um Find out why we're doing the same thing if it's not working. Right. I mean, if we if if the agenda was in a company, we need to increase our sales uh, in 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 this uh, region of the world, and uh, right. you know, five three years later, and look at it and like it hasn't moved a needle. I would say right. we, we need to do something different. I mean, that's right. what I guess. 
I mean, so yes, and and if every year you're it, like every year you're releasing reports that saying, oh, we're disappointed, like <laughs> you're going to be di- disappointed for decades. <laughs> like, at, at what point do you take responsibility for for that failure? Um, who who does that failure belong to? Like, who who gets to own that failure? And I I think the way it's been looked at is you can blame a consultant or you can blame you know the diversities are you can blame. It's it's out there, you know. The finger is pointing outward when it really should, you know, go in the other direction. Well, it, it it's a it's a systemic problem, and it's a leadership issue. And in, in in a lot in a lot of um, these situations. Well, if it is, I mean, let's look at it from the perspective of of the systemic qualities of it. I mean, because I think um, it, I mean, you know, the the idea that there isn't a reevaluation of the methodology suggests right. to me that there isn't necessarily a feeling of genuine failure, that the attempt is sufficient for a lot of right. the people who are, right. who are doing this to fulfill what is the actual problem, which is the yeah, perception and I, that they're right. And I, Right. And I think perception has a lot to do with this, too. I think many people have still um, clung to this mythology that, you know, people of color are not in these positions because there are not enough qualified people of color or they're, you know, um, the the problem is the pipeline. Um, That's a that's that's a, 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 a critique that you heard a lot in the 1960s when diversity became, uh, you know, sort of like a public, you know, a social concern, you know, from the president on down. This is something that we need to to address. Um, there was an acknowledgement that that African-Americans and other people of color had been systemically shut out of most fields. But in that time, in, in the 50 years that, ha- that have, uh, you know, since then, um, it, it's no longer possible to, to point solely to a pipeline issue when you've had scores of people of color going through not only just college, but some of the most elite schools in this country. And yet we still have this problem where we're saying, you know, we tried and, you know, we just kind of throw up our hands. And it's like, no, let's let's do a little bit more than that. Let's let's really look. So something that Coca-Cola did after it, it was sued for discrimination and, and it settled. Um, what it did is it looked at the metrics across the company. It looked at hiring, promotions, bonuses, who was getting, who was not, by racial group, by gender. And then they were able to both identify patterns of bias and to disrupt those patterns of bias in real time. So they would look at these metrics even before a job offer was made, even before, um, you know, bonuses or, 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 you know, raises were, were given to see are there patterns of bias? You know, a lot of this is not intentional bias, but you know, we we live in a, a racialized society where where you know ideas are deeply embedded and they they play out in 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 ways that are kind of insidious. We don't often see it. It's sort of an invisible thing. But if you look at the metrics in this way, then maybe you can like make some adjustments. So this is just one way that a company kind of turned itself around um, well, and, you, and became a lot more racially diverse. Can you give us a, a, like a like a like even a more a sort of like granular examples in that way? So in other words, um, you would look in the uh, I don't know the I don't know the different divisions of, of Coca-Cola, but you would look in distribution and, right. So uh, you'd look at people in the same job and see, OK, like what are the salaries across that 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 job category? What um, um, if you if you're hiring, what what does the applicant pool look like? What does the who's getting bonuses? So if you look at that across the board and you kind of like, you know, do that kind of assessment, uh you can actually see <laughs> patterns. And um, so that's how they did it. Um, and but then they would say to the it. human resources uh, in those uh, different divisions, 
Look, you are um, yeah, what's your going rate of hiring is is uh, much lower based upon right. the applicant pool you have or right. another division. Right. Your bonuses right. are, are, are uh, you know, and, and making people conscious of that. Uh, of disparities. Right. Making people a lot more conscious of these patterns of disparity. Uh, yeah. So that that's one way. And I mean, obviously, that took that took intention. It took um you know, vigilance, um, but that's that's what they did, and that's how they turned Coca-Cola around. Um, so there are models that are, that exist, um, you know. But if you look in higher education, where African Americans are about four percent of university professors, and Latinos are three percent or under, um, like in, in a country where those two groups alone are about thirty percent of the population, you know something needs to like there should be some way to look at what's going on what's going on with who's not only who's hired who's even considered uh for for these positions to what extent i mean it, it i mean is there a um is there a a, a pipeline problem or a uh, maybe I mean a culture. Uh, there's obviously a cultural problem insofar as you have these disparities in the way that maybe people perceive. But I, you know, uh, a while back we interviewed. Uh, maybe I guess it was over the summer. Uh, Anthony Abraham Jack, who who uh, wrote a book. Uh, I think it was called The uh, Privileged Poor, uh, about mm -hmm. um, how elite colleges are failing disadvantaged students. Um, where it, you know, uh, one of the things he looked at was. Uh, particularly um, um, African American uh, students who were, you know, coming from uh, from uh, living, you know, in poverty or uh, uh, down further on the income distribution, and that colleges would seek out uh, African American students. Um, they were more apt to admit them if they had already been accultured in a private school. Uh, mm -hmm. in some way. And I, right. I, I wonder to... to well, they, they, because, uh, you know, I, I guess that their defense is that they want students who can compete with <laughs> with, with with their peers and they, 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 they don't want to set students up to fail. But I guess what, what, what I want to say about this is that, um, you know, I think you're talking about the pipeline. And uh, as I said, for five decades, we've talked about the pipeline. For many of these fields, that's no longer the issue, um, because what I found is that the more elite, the smaller, the more boutique a field is, the less diverse it is. So we're talking about oftentimes like newsrooms where we're not talking about large numbers of people. Right. <laughs> we're talking about, like, if you only look at, took one elite journalism school and and just considered candidates from that one elite journalism school you could you could turn around newsrooms <laughs> like pretty much overnight um with diversity so i think you know i the the higher up you go the more elite um the field or or uh you know museums um we're not talking about needing you know thousands of people i it, i think it's why Companies like Coca-Cola, um, you know, corporate America is far more diverse than some of the more uh, elite progressive fields. You know, we look at journalism, we look at, um, uh, you know, all the other higher ed. It, it, it doesn't take that many people to move the needle on this, on this, but yet we're not really moving the needle. Okay. So if I understand what you're saying, you know, that, that you're talking about, um, you know, Coca-Cola hires, um, uh, thousands of people, exactly. where, whereas, you know, thousands of people may, uh, include everybody who works in broadcast media in New York city. Um, right. and that the, to, in terms of getting percentages, um, much easier to find, candidates uh you know enough, uh, theoretically but but so right. let me ask you this is it is it um is it and i guess what i was getting at with 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 bringing up um that that other uh research was that is the issue that there are sort of like 
I guess th there are cultural streams or something like that that people don't recognize and don't break out of um, that, um, you know, uh, that that there is other factors at work or they just I mean, well, there are, there are definitely social networks. And right. I think a lot of this is due to social networks. I mean, I live in New York City. Uh, have have you know I'm born and raised here, and I often attend events uh, related to publishing or journalism or the arts, and oftentimes um, I, I'm one of few people of color in the room. Um, it, these are fields that in which people of, of color are acutely underrepresented, and I think these kind of segregated social spheres are then replicated in the workplace because who do we hire? We hire who we know, who we're friends with, who our friends recommend. And I think, you know, we do live in a society in which we are pretty much socially segregated. Uh, and, and, and I think that then plays out in other ways. So I'm not talking about overt racism. I'm right. just talking right. about the natural ebb and flow of <laughs> of our relations and, and what happens due to those relations. So who gets recommended for a, a faculty position? Who gets recommended for a, a great, you know, position at a radio station or a TV station or a newspaper? Oftentimes, it's not people who who are not reflected in these very um, small social spheres. So I, I think and, that's, and, that's and we a should natural say, part of this. Yeah. Those things are downstream from right. more uh, racist practices, right? Precisely. This has nothing to do. This is not racism. This is just the way we live in, in a society that has kind of been um, socially ordered this way. We, we live in, in a very, you know, we like to think of ourselves as living in a, in a progressive, integrated society, but, you know, our churches are pretty much segregated. Our schools are pretty much segregated. Our, our you know, Where we living live. arrangements. Right. Our, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so this is all part and parcel of, of, you know, how we find these workplaces and, and particularly the more elite ones um, are, are, are still very, very uh, segregated. And, and, and theoretically, a lot of these elite ones, too, probably have um, a, a more bearing. And certainly when you talk about journalism, when we talk about entertainment on some level, more bearing right. on uh, uh, the culture in some ways, you know. Precisely. It, it, OK, so. How much of the the argument of, you know, who our market is? I mean, for instance, I can tell you that I used to, um, uh, years and years ago, I was a sitcom actor. And uh, I did a, a sitcom where I played the uh, white uh, writer on an all-black variety show. It was a very <laughs> early job I had. Uh, it was on Fox TV. I'm not doing an advertisement for myself. It's long gone. Um, but, but I, it was, it was really my first or second job in Hollywood, and um, I, it didn't occur to me until the 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 decade that followed how mm -hmm. rare it was that I was on a show where I was the only white guy, maybe there was one other white guy on the show and everyone right. else was black because, right. uh, and the difficulty of a show like that because of it, you know, or I should say, you know, the audience, the, the cell to the audience is very segregated. It's, it's either gotta be a black show but, or a white but I show. Think, but, but I think that's a really old fashioned way of looking at the world as it is today. Well, I got to um, say, all, to be fair, of, no, that was 25 years ago. But that, yes, all of the research shows that more diverse casts are are make more money. <laughs> uh, films with uh, diversity make more money than films that don't have it. Um, so I think that is the way that that that's a very old Hollywood way of looking at it, that you do a black cast for a black audience and a white cast for a white audience. Shonda Rhimes kind of like just exploded that whole myth mm. um, 
by having diverse casts that were are, are among the most popular shows on television. Um, and we're seeing the same thing with film. Um, the, uh, the Hollywood Diversity Report, there are a number of reports that come out every year by uh, USC and UCLA that show that diversity sells, and, and it, particularly in a global market that is, that is more um, – you know, likely to to gravitate to films that that reflect the world. So yeah, I think there was a time when that is the way that that's what producers, directors, um, you know, people who greenlight projects thought of audiences, but that is not actually how audience audiences work. Look at some of the, the, the biggest films uh, of the past couple of years. Uh, Black Panther, uh, Crazy right. Rich Asians. Um, you know, I can go on and on. Well, I think don't it's, fall I think... into that predictable like blacks for blacks and whites for whites. I mean... Uh, I think the consumer-facing aspect... No, I, I mean, uh -huh. I, and I agree. And, I, and, and this show was, you know, in the uh, uh, mid-90s, and, and I think um, the the consumer facing part of it now I think right. is uh, has changed. Um, mm -hmm. Yet you still have a problem with the with the producers in terms of right. like a lack of diversity. You still have a problem with the writers in in terms of a lack of diversity. Um, the people who aren't facing you know sort of consumer facing on some level. And um, I. I so, but I guess my point was more just sort of the consciousness of the different networks that existed. Like I would, I never right, saw right. any of those, uh, those, those men and women that I was on that show with. I never saw them again. Like, they, you know, at auditions. to the point about our separate social yes. spheres. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many weddings or parties I've gone to of my white friends when I'm it. So <laughs> like, how, so, okay. And so, so I understand you can, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a company the size of Coca-Cola, you can make right. these changes because you can actually, you have a lot of data. Um, exactly. If you're talking about a small, um, you know, uh, like a like a small journalism shop, or you're talking about, you know, even like a broadcast news, and you don't have that many people there, the data is not as sort of like obvious, right? Where because like one person could change the percentage by you know a significant amount. Um, how do you do it in that? Like, wh what is? Wh are there? Well, do you have examples I, in that I, situation where? I, yeah, I guess diversity just has to matter to a company. Matter not just, um, you know, for the bottom line, but matter as just an issue of justice and what's right. Um, do we not hire people because they're of color? Does having diversity make us smarter, give us, give us a, you know, just a, a, a broader take on the society that, that we're covering? I mean, can you really cover a diverse society with all white newsrooms or can you do it fairly? Can, can you do, you know, can you do it well? Um, so, so I think when we think of diversity as more than just uh, check a box, um, but as something that actually makes us better, um, then I think that might give uh, news directors, managers, more of an incentive to do it because it just will make for a better product. But what if um, they don't? How you how you do it is it, it's it's really not that hard. I, I know at NYU when, um, you know, when we have searches, because we have a, a far more diverse faculty now than when I joined the faculty 25 years ago, we have a much broader social network and, and professional network that, you know, that we have our tentacles out right. in the world and in a, in a, you know, a far more <laughs> comprehensive way. It becomes so self-replicating on some level. Precisely. But and and if you... you don't have that and it's not self-replicating, it's not that hard, especially in journalism. I mean, we're journalists. <laughs> we, right. we do research. Um, how, how do we find people who don't look like us? Well, well, what if there, there is not that? There organizations. There are, you know, there are all kinds of ways to do it. It's really not. I, I think we treat diversity as like rocket science, like to, to do it is like so hard. It really isn't. 
Well, it then really isn't. what if the answer is that there's a lot of these places that don't consider it important and that uh, well, they don't consider it that... important beyond the sort of the public relations aspect of it, which well, they feel is satisfied by expending money and saying we're doing our best. Well, then then we'll continue to have the consistently uh, disappointing reports and and we'll just like accept that. I guess I guess I'm calling it out. <laughs> because, because I mean, come on, right. it's, it's like 50 years of saying the same thing. It's, it's just, it doesn't go down well. Such as the failed promise of a billion dollar business diversity Inc. Uh, Pamela Newkirk. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam.